Welcome or welcome back to this new video. Today we are going to talk about some of the most famous female killers in the world. Before we start though, leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more videos like these. Let's start with our list of our three female killers. You ever heard of the Countess of Blood, Elizabeth Bathory? In the heart of the 16th century nestled in the region of Transylvania, a child named Elizabeth Bathory was born into one of the most powerful families in Central Europe. Her lineage was steeped in wealth and nobility, shaping an upbringing that was nothing short of royal. Elizabeth was not just a privileged child, she was a pivotal member of an influential dynasty. She grew under the watchful eyes of her powerful parents, learning the ropes of aristocracy. Her life took another prestigious turn when she married Ferenc Nadasdi, a union that further cemented her status in society. Together, they brought forth children, living the life of a noble family. Elizabeth Bathory, the noblewoman, the wife and the mother. A picture of grace and power you might think, but as we will see, her life took a dark turn that would earn her an infamous reputation. In the early 1600s, Elizabeth Bathory's actions started to arouse suspicion. As the countess of a powerful family, her noble status initially shielded her from scrutiny. However, whispers of her actions began to grow louder, each one more horrifying than the last. The talk of the town was the disappearance of young girls. Many were servants in the Bathory household but others were daughters of local gentry, sent to learn courtly etiquette under the Countess's tutelage. The girls would enter the castle, but they would never be seen again. Their family's inquiries were met with vague explanations of illness or accidents. Yet the frequency of these tragedies pointed to a nefarious pattern. The rumors painted a gruesome picture of the Countess's alleged activities, it was said that she subjected her victims to unimaginable torture. Tales of mutilation were horrifyingly prevalent, with accounts of Elizabeth Bathory taking a perverse pleasure in the infliction of pain. But the most chilling part of the story was her alleged obsession with blood. It was said that the Countess believed in the regenerative properties of virgin blood. A macabre ritual began to surface in the whispers of the populace. They spoke of the Countess bathing in the blood of these innocent victims, a horrifying practice she believed would preserve her youth and beauty. The Countess's reign of terror went on unabated for nearly a decade. The noble status that initially protected her also made it difficult for authorities to intervene. Yet, as the body count rose and the stories became more horrifying, the authorities were forced to pay attention. Elizabeth Bathory's noble status may have protected her from immediate action, but it couldn't silence the whispers of her horrifying deeds. Her dark fascination with blood, and her ruthless treatment of young girls made her a figure of dread. But, as the accusations mounted the authorities could no longer ignore the Countess of Blood. The whispers had grown into screams, and the reign of the Blood Countess was about to face its reckoning. In 1610, the reign of the Countess of Blood came to an end. Emperor Matthias II had had enough. He ordered the arrest of Elizabeth Bathory. Her actions had created a whirlwind of horror that could no longer be ignored. Yet even then, her nobility saved her from a formal trial, a privilege that did not extend to her staff. They were tried, found guilty, and executed for their part in her heinous crimes. Bathory, meanwhile, was imprisoned in the cold and desolate Cactiche Castle. She spent her final years confined to its stone walls, a far cry from the lavish lifestyle she had once enjoyed. Four years later in 1614, the Countess of Blood drew her final breath. Her dark reign had finally come to an end. Do you know any similar events? Comment on this video and let us know what you think. Let's continue with the next story. What drives a person to become a serial killer? To answer this question, we delve into the life of Aileen Warnos, America's first female serial killer. Born on a leap day in 1956 in Rochester, Michigan, Aileen's journey into darkness began early. Her childhood was a tumultuous storm of abandonment and instability. Her parents, absent from her life, left her in a world that was far from nurturing. The shaky grounds of her upbringing saw her tossed from one unstable environment to another, even landing her in an orphanage. But the torment didn't stop there. Aileen's young life was marred by horrific sexual abuse and violence, forcing her to grapple with a reality that no child should ever have to face. These early years were not just a childhood lost but a life set on a tragic trajectory. The harsh realities of Aileen's early life laid the foundation for the path she would later tread. In the late 1980s Aileen embarked on a deadly journey transforming her from a victim to a villain. Warnos's life took a turn for the worse as she began to walk a path marked by violence and death. 
This was a journey that would earn her a chilling title, the first female serial killer in the United States. During this period Aileen committed a series of gruesome murders taking the lives of seven men. These weren't random acts of violence but rather, they were a part of a calculated operation. Aileen's victims were often men to whom she provided sexual services. Her method was as cold as it was cruel. She would shoot her victims, leaving them lifeless before robbing them of their belongings. But the true horror of her crimes lay not just in the act itself, but in the chilling calmness with which she carried them out. Each murder was a testament to the darkness that had consumed her, a stark contrast to her chaotic early life. Yet despite the heinous nature of her actions, there was a twisted sense of logic to them. Aileen was a woman who had been abused and discarded by society. In her mind, these murders were acts of retribution, a way for her to take back control. By 1990, Aileen had claimed the lives of seven men, marking her place in the annals of American crime history. Aileen Warnos had become a symbol of death and despair, a tragic figure whose life was a testament to the destructive power of violence and neglect. Aileen's reign of terror came to an end in 1991, when she was captured by the police. The law enforcement authorities had been on her tail, following a trail of bodies and a string of gruesome murders. When they finally caught up with her, it marked the beginning of a new chapter in her life, one marked by judicial proceedings and the looming shadow of the death sentence. Aileen stood before the court, accused of the cold-blooded murder of seven men. She didn't deny her actions but claimed they were acts of self-defense. She painted a picture of herself as a woman driven to the edge, forced to kill in order to protect herself from rape attempts by the men she serviced. But the court wasn't buying her story. The evidence against Aileen was damning. There was the consistency in her modus operandi, the theft of her victim's belongings, and the multiple gunshot wounds that suggested a brutality beyond self-defense. The jury saw through her claims and found her guilty of first-degree murder. The gavel came down hard on Aileen Warnos. She was sentenced to death, a verdict that sent ripples through the nation. She would spend over a decade on death row, a grim reminder of the deadly path she had chosen. Despite her pleas of self-defense, the evidence stacked against Aileen was overwhelming, and her fate was sealed. It was a chilling end to a story marked by violence, desperation, and a life that had spiraled tragically out of control. Aileen Warnos's story didn't end with her death sentence. In the years that followed her conviction she became a subject of intense media scrutiny and public fascination. There was a divide in perceptions. Some saw her as a ruthless monster, a cold-blooded killer. Others however painted her as a victim of society, a woman who had been abused and discarded, driven to extremes by a life of hardship and despair. In 2002 her story reached its grim conclusion when she was executed by lethal injection in Florida. But even in death, Warnos's tale lived on. Her life and crimes inspired books, documentaries and even the Academy Award-winning film, Monster, with Charlize Theron delivering a haunting portrayal of Warnos. Aileen Warnos, a name synonymous with both victimhood and villainy, left behind a legacy that continues to intrigue and horrify us to this day. Our latest story is truly disturbing where one of the figures we consider most pure become causes of misfortune. Ever wonder how the mind of a child criminal works? What could possibly drive a child to commit heinous acts? In the heart of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England in the late 60s, a tale of darkness and violence began to unfold. The protagonist of this chilling saga was an 11-year-old girl named Mary Bell. Raised in a challenging environment, Mary's life was far from the innocent playgrounds and carefree laughter that typically defines childhood. Her world was one of hardship and turmoil, a breeding ground for the unimaginable. And from this world, a monstrous act emerged. In May of 1968 Mary Bell committed her first crime. Her victim was a young boy, Martin Brown, merely four years old. With cold calculation she ended his life, marking the start of a horrifying journey down a path few dare tread. A seemingly regular girl, yet she had just committed her first murder at an age when most children are still playing with toys. But Mary's dark journey didn't stop at one, it was merely the beginning of a chilling path. Hardly two months had passed since the tragic end of Little Martin Brown when Mary Bell and Norma Bell, unrelated despite the shared surname, struck again. This time, their target was Brian Howe, an innocent three-year-old boy who was just beginning to explore the world around him. The details of Brian's murder were particularly disturbing. Mary and Norma not only strangled the young boy but also mutilated his body post-mortem. Their disregard for life was chilling, their actions beyond comprehension. This was not just a crime of opportunity, but a deliberate act of violence, a testament to the dark paths that Mary Bell was treading. 
The community of Newcastle upon Tyne was gripped by fear. Parents held their children a little closer, their eyes scanning the streets for hidden dangers. The realization that the predator was not a menacing adult but two young girls was a shocking revelation that sent tremors through the town. Life as they knew it was disrupted, replaced by an undercurrent of dread that lingered long after the murders. The heinous acts of Mary and Norma were not just crimes against their victims, they were crimes against childhood itself. They shattered the innocence and trust that are the hallmarks of this tender age. Two innocent lives were snuffed out by a child who herself should have been enjoying the innocence of childhood. Eventually, justice caught up with Mary and Norma. In the bleak winter of 1968, their young faces were splashed across the front pages as they stood trial. The British public watched in horror as details of the gruesome crimes were laid bare. Mary was convicted of manslaughter due to diminished responsibility, a decision influenced by psychiatric reports that found her to display classic symptoms of psychopathy. Norma, deemed to be under Mary's influence, was convicted as an accessory. The trial not only shocked the nation, but also provoked intense debate around the psychological complexities of Mary's case. The question on everyone's mind, how could a child commit such acts? Theories ranged from childhood trauma to inherent evil, yet none could truly explain the events. The case of Mary Bell remains one of the most chilling in British crime history. Mary Bell, once an innocent child was now a convicted child killer. So what became of Mary Bell, the girl who shocked a nation? After her release in 1980, Mary sought anonymity, living a life far from the public eye. The debate about her reintegration into society lingered, with many questioning the justice in her freedom. But Mary's life post-prison remains shrouded in mystery, a stark contrast to the infamous childhood that once gripped the nation's attention. Here, our adventure comes to an end. Thank you all for making it to the end of the video. Activate the bell to stay updated, stay curious.